Don Clark was our coach. Uh, unfortunately, he's not around anymore either, but um, he would always just say, stay out. Don't come off the ice. And then I remember I, I had a back injury when I came out of camp uh, in Toronto and I'd take the first two games off and I got eight points my first game when I came back. Eight? And eight, yeah. And Bantam had uh, a breakaway uh, for six goals in the game and he missed it. And I was like, pissed off. I'm like, you idiot. Like, he's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get more goals. But, uh, yeah, we went on quite a ride. I, that was a year that I was kind of, kind of went in the dumps because of, uh, I didn't get even invited to world juniors and I was the leading scorer in all of Canada at that time. And then, uh, I guess the guy in Kelowna, I, I won't say his name, but it, he, he was the head coach for uh, world juniors. Everybody could figure it out, but he thought we took uh, too much time on the ice and we were told to stay on the ice. So it, it kind of was a conflict, but uh, yeah. then we went on a run and we just, uh, I made a little bit of money from Toronto for being the leading scorer in Canada. So it was oh. not too bad. <laughs> That was former WHL scoring champion and Maple Leaf prospect Mark Dial, and you're listening to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padolan. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games but thought he was destined for 1,000. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. So today, today's guest on the program is another old teammate of mine from back in the St. John's Maple Leafs days, uh, and his name is Mark Dial. Uh, Mark hails from Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, born in 1976, same birth year as myself, and uh, ended up coming into the WHL ranks as a Saskatoon Blade. Uh, Mark was never a big player, uh, was a little bit before his time in that category, uh, probably played at around, I think he says 145 pounds in this episode uh, when he first stepped into the WHL. Uh, ended up topping out at 5'10", 5'11", and probably around 170 max, but uh, that didn't stop Mark from getting it done. As you can see from his uh, from the back of his hockey card, where he uh, led the Saskatoon Blades, not only the Saskatoon Blades, but the entire WHL in scoring uh, his third season with 159 points in 69 games. Uh, Mark put up 61 goals, 98 assists for 159 points, and that mark has not been uh, has not been beat uh, since he put it up in 95-96. No one has surpassed his totals. Uh, their line in Saskatoon was ridiculous. Uh, it was Mark in the middle uh, between Clark Wilm and Frank Bannum. Clark Wilm went on to actually take the NHL games played crown between the three of them. Uh, Clark put up 50 goals uh, on his own right there uh, that season. Frank Bannum threw up 83 goals, another number that hasn't been beat since, uh, since Frank put it up there. Frank was a super fast player, a really good shot, uh, lethal scorer. Mark loved to pass the puck. And uh, Clark just loved to crash the net. He protected those two guys, and he went into the corners and obviously had good enough mitts in, in his own right to put up 50, which is, small, is no small uh, feat. However, uh, yeah, b back in the day, you you, uh, you wouldn't have imagined that, that, that Clark would have been the one that, that went on to the uh, to the, w I mean, the NHL success that he did. Of course, taking nothing away from Clark, he was a heck of a player and a gritty player, and I played against him, and he was tough as nails, uh, and he deserved every game that he got. But it's just funny how, you know, we assume – sometimes that the uh the talent and the speed and the you know the guy with the best shot is the one that's going to end up playing in the greatest league in the world and that's not always the case however um mark has an interesting story because uh, he went on well, he was drafted as, as a fifth rounder to toronto which is uh which is a great accomplishment uh for mark especially the size like i have already mentioned that he was this was an era when uh, size was highly valued, and big, strong uh, players were were the uh, were definitely in vogue. And it was harder to get it to get around and to get through and to get recognized by NHL scouts when you were when you were on the smaller size. But Mark still was able to go in the fifth round, 
uh, came into St. John's and made the St. John's Maple Leafs, uh, led the team in points in his second season there. I was fortunate enough to play with with Mark uh, a little bit with my time there. Um, but after I got traded, well, actually, that's not true. I'm going to rewind the story. So when I was in St. John's with Mark, it was both of our third seasons there. Uh, Mark had a really unfortunate in- incident where he was driving the puck uh, into the into the offensive zone, got tripped up from behind. When he did that, his skate came up and caught uh, the defenseman in the face. His name was Jeff Libby. Jeff ended up losing his eye because of this incident. I was there for that. I saw that happen. Um, Mark and I discussed that, how that impacted him personally, um, you know, just the ramifications of that, feeling responsible, even though the, there was there was no fault to Mark there. Uh, but the really strange and, and you know, I don't know if it's coincidental or irony or what's the right word there, but after I got traded at the trade deadline, obviously the season went on for the St. John's Maple Leafs and they were in the playoffs and Mark was playing against the Fredericton Canadians and uh, off a of play, which we discuss, Mark ends up taking a stick in the eye and he loses his eye. This is in the same season, the same hockey season, two Players lost their eye, and Mark was involved in both of them, and they were both on the same ice in St. John's, Newfoundland. So really, really crazy. We talk about Mark having to deal with that injury, trying to come back from it, uh, trying to resurrect his, his NHL career or you know what he wanted to, to be as an NHL career. and um, Just crazy, crazy stuff that people go through. And when we talk about you know, the consequences of that and, uh, and how the, the team, the, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs dealt with that, uh, how us as teammates um, helped him deal with it on both sides, the Jeff Libby scenario and, and the one where, uh, where he lost his own eye. And, you know, I think you'll hear from the interview that I'm proud to say that hockey's come a long way. I, I think that the situation would have been handled much better uh, in today's 2021 version of hockey and the culture that's around there. But back in our day, there really wasn't much support on the emotional, mental side. And, um, you know, and I, for one, apologize to Mark for not being more aware of that in the time. Uh, you know, the the human element of, uh, of what was happening there, uh, I think, was overlooked by a lot of us. So... Um, lots of good stuff in this interview. I hope you're going to uh, listen to the end. That's where Mark talks about his, uh, you know, what happened to him and his comeback and and uh, and all that good stuff. So, without further ado, I bring you my former teammate, Mr. Mark Dial. All right, welcome back to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Padol. And my special guest today is a former teammate from back on the rock, Mr. Mr. Mark Dial. How are you doing today, buddy? Yeah, amazing. It's good to see you, actually. It's a long time coming that we uh, never stayed in touch, but we all uh, traveled around the world and we lose contact. So it's great to see you. So. I know, man. That's the way it goes, right? Especially, uh, well, I mean... You you had things cut short, which we're going to get to. Myself, I mean, I ended up being a suitcase and being everywhere, and it's definitely hard to keep in touch with everybody from every from every team. So this is this pod has been giving me an awesome excuse to get in touch with guys. So yeah, good to see your face too, and be able to have a chance to catch up here. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm in the gra- I'm in the garage. So yeah, <laughs> I got kicked out with the kids in the, out of school and the wife at. Uh, working from home so <laughs> hey man we know our place right we know our place <laughs> uh, yeah man you got a really interesting story and i know it's a story that maybe um hasn't been told so it's i'm kind of excited to get into it uh just with how it ended of course but also how it started because uh even in looking in in the research here you know i obviously yeah we played against each other in the uh in the dub you know so we were from from that same draft class we got drafted in, in 94 together so i knew all about you even though you were out east um just because you may could see the points you were putting up and to this day um maybe you know maybe you don't know but no one's passed the 159 that you put up that year um that that mark still ha- holds not that it's the highest mark ever in whl history but since you've put 159 on the board in the 95 96 season it hasn't been touched so um Definitely want to chat about that because, uh, you know, a friend of yours and a friend of mine still, Frank Bannum, was your teammate there then. You guys obviously had some chemistry. He went on some good things too. But let's go back even before that, Dees, and uh, 
and like before you got to the blades, what was, uh, where were you at and where were you playing? Well, I think the biggest thing back then, and you know it, uh, like I do, it was all about size and how big you were. And, um, if you weren't six feet tall at the Bantam draft, you like weren't even noticed. And I remember the day that, uh, um, my dad said, Hey, pick Brandon, pick Regina, pick Moose Jaw, pick Saskatoon. Where do you want to go? And I picked Moose Jaw. And then all of a sudden a phone call came from a buddy in Regina that I used to play with because I was living in Winnipeg for a year. And he's like, come to Saskatoon. And my dad was cheap. He wanted me to <laughs> save money on hotels and stuff. So I went to Saskatoon and that's when I lit it up with, uh, uh, Mr. Frank Bannum. I call him Bimbo, but, uh, um, yeah, and then uh, I got signed. I didn't get drafted in the band draft. Back in our days, there was only three rounds that you got picked in. And obviously, I was so small. I was only 112 pounds when I was 14. So it, nobody was looking at you at that time. So right. it kind of just unfolded that way. And uh, when I signed the the agreement with the, with the, the Blades in Saskatoon, uh, uh, Lubinicki was the GM. And he thought I was a year older. He didn't even know how old I was. So, but it, it, it kind of just unfolded that it, uh, it happened that way and ended up with some good teammates. So, sure, sure. So, you went to a rookie camp. Is that what you're saying? Like, you got invited to a rookie camp or decided to go to, like, how, how did that, how did that transpire? Well, it was all those letters that they sent out all the time that uh, you could come here and, and no different than, uh, you know, the uh, BCHL that used to send them out and they wanted just, you know, players to be on the rink to pay for the, the ice time kind of thing. But yeah, I got lucky and uh, things worked out pretty good in Saskatoon. So how was that camp though? So, I mean, so you're small at the time. You I mean, now you're 5'11". Uh, well, you're 5'11". Is that where you ended up at? Uh, I try to say six feet, but uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, but how old were you then? You were a six, did you play at I 17 would, then? Your first year, 17? I would have been 16. I would have been 16 when I went there. Yeah. And then I was so small, my parents agreed that, you know, coming back to Midget again and did pretty well there and uh, went back at 17 when I first started. Gotcha, gotcha. So what was pretty small that year? Do you remember what how, how tall you were, how how heavy you were? Uh, when I was in Midget AAA in Winnipeg, it would have, I would have been 100 and, ooh, I'd be pushing 130, maybe 5'8 at the time. Right. So wow, led, yeah. the league in, led the league in scoring. I think I had 102 points or something, and nobody's had that, I guess, since. Well, nobody plays anymore right now. But, uh, yeah, I we were playing against big boys when me and you were playing. So Yeah, for sure. So, okay, so, wow, that's wild. So, yeah, definitely uh, so slight slight a build. Hadn't hadn't quite, uh, you know, filled into your body yet. And the next year you come to, double, uh, to Saskatoon and make that team out of uh, – out of camp did you know that you were going to make that team like was that pretty much understood or did you have to earn your spot on that squad uh i think you always got to earn your spot definitely but it was more of you know the first inner squad game i had eight points and they came to me right away and said you're you're definitely on the team here's your billets and they asked you know you remember those days with, with billets uh uh, you know, your preference, who you'd like to be with. And I said, I'm allergic to cats. And where did I get put in? I got put in with a cat. Uh, <laughs> so, it, so I had to move billets after, cause I came to a practice with all these hives on my face and everything. And, uh, Lauren Mulliken's like, what's up diesel. And I'm like, uh, I'm allergic to cats. So then I automatically got taken off the ice and which billets and I ended up with the Prasovskis. I don't know if you remember Tyler Prasovsky. I do remember that name. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So those were great billets of mine that I had. And so it ended up being better that way. So it was uh, kind of a funny thing how that happened. Yeah. No kidding. They didn't read the fine print there. The only thing that you couldn't handle. Um, <laughs> so, so that was a, I mean, that must've been a heck of a year, right? I mean, you, you, you have a great year of midget put up a hundred points, even though you're 140 pounds, I can't imagine you packed on too much weight over that summer there to get ready for the WHL. I know I remember how hard it was for me to put on weight at that time. It's your teenage years. It's kind of, kind of difficult. So you mean you roll in there and you're not, you're not, uh, you're not a huge man at this stage. And then you, you make the blades and you end up getting drafted that year. Like, was that, 
like going into training camp, was that something that you thought could be on the horizon? I know you probably wanted it to be on the horizon, but did you did you think that was going to happen? Yeah, I, I don't know. I I look at it and I speak to this with my kids, like be humble. Like you, you kind of knew where you were at with how, you know, what you could could do in the uh, hockey industry. But um, I guess when you're always told you're too small, you're, you know, all this stuff, that you're not going to make it. And then, you know, I got the opportunity and, and went with it. Like I was 152 pounds. Or, like I got all my cards still. I, I check all that stuff. My kids, you know, shaved my head, give me a mullet the other, or a few weeks ago, just they, they saw stuff that they hadn't seen real, like looked at a lot. And yeah. uh, to me, it's, you know, it, and I, I look at it with even kids now, obviously with the COVID and all that stuff, it's, you, you can persevere with anything. You did it. I did it. You know, it, it's a matter of, you know, I, I talked about uh, Demmer to them, Nathan Dempsey, uh, you know, with his struggles now, like I went and saw him years ago and I didn't know he had the disease and he was shaking and I, and then Trish looked at me and was like, you don't know? And I'm like, no. And then we went golfing and, you know, he was probably the fittest guy that I've ever played with. And he was my roommate on the road all the time. Um, but yeah, no, it, 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 I think everything unfolds for a reason. Um, you know, you, you meet great people. It, it just sucks that we live so far apart from all the people that we played with, because I think when you get in the locker room, that is your like life. You, you, you get the humor, you get all the jokes, you get all the fun, you get all the, you know, I, I guess the run and gun that you got a little bit in your heart that you want to kick butt, right? And that, that's how I, that's what I miss from that part of it. So. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, you know, the, the competition is one thing. I think, you know, guys, guys are often quoted as saying, you know, they miss the ability to compete, right? Like that's you know, where do you get that? Right. Uh, where do you get that? It, it's hard to find that uh, elsewhere. Some guys find it, you know, in business, but obviously it's a different type of competition, right. That you're, that you're in there. So the competition is, is tough. But, I mean, as far, but as far as the other thing goes, it's like the family, right. It's like the showing up at the rink and it's, it is those relationships and the jokes and the time on the bus and all that great stuff that I think that most of us remember most fondly, uh, about our, about our career. But, um, yeah, I mean, but back to your draft year though, boss, like, I mean, you talked about being, it was a, a bigger era as, as far as being a hockey player was concerned. You know, uh, you know, Korea had come before us. There were some guys that were playing, right, that were smaller, but it was it was a real hard, it was a hard racket being being small, without question. One, because it was hard to perform if you were small, um, just the way that the rules were and everything else. But two, um, definitely not that fondly looked upon by scouts, you know, yet you were able here to go fifth round, 126, um, in that draft year with these guys, you know, kind of first laying eyes on you. So I think that's pretty impressive in and of its own right. Uh, was that something that you, at what point did you know you were going to get drafted and, uh, and where did you think you were going to go going into that draft? Yeah, I never knew I was going to get drafted. We did really well to get to the, um, the final that year against Kamloops. We played against, and I always tell people now on that Blazers team, there was 14 out of the 20 that played in the NHL. So we, we had kind of a plugger team. Um, obviously I was a small guy. Um, I didn't even have an agent at that time. And I don't know if you want to talk about agency. I did it for 11 years and all that jazz, but you know, I, I had no clue what an agent was. And my GM just said, use him. And he was one of the bigger dogs and, you know, uh, it, 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 agents are, you know, I don't think they're needed at a young age, but, uh, uh, you know, your parents get you to the level that you're at. I think they're the most important people, but at the same time, that was kind of the, the trend that started when we were younger. And then now you, you see agents that are looking at kids that are 11 and 12. And, you know, I got out of the industry. It was just a, a grind and a, a tough battle, but yeah, I, Lauren Mullican pushed for me, I guess, to get uh, drafted. I wish I didn't get drafted because I went in the fifth round and uh, I think it would have helped out for the following year, but you know, things fall, uh, fall into play. 
Right, right, right. So you didn't know. So going in, you hadn't had any interviews, really. Like you, you weren't really watching the hockey news, or your name wasn't really mentioned th- there. Is that what you're saying? Like a- after the season, then all of a sudden you got the phone call from Toronto, and there you were, a fifth round pick. Yeah, I, I, I did do a like a few interviews. Anaheim, Washington, the typical ones that always were around Saskatoon area because they had their scouts and all that jazz. But to be honest with you, I was sleeping when I got drafted and got a phone call <laughs> and what did that feel like was that was, were you pumped like man only now you're saying you wish you didn't but i'm sure at the time you weren't well maybe i don't know how, how was it when you got when you when you got that well, phone call yeah it's an honor to get drafted i just knew and you know it like i do that you know there was no salary cap back then and you kind of knew where you wanted to get drafted i thought i was going to anaheim because they were just starting up then um the guy came and met me and met me and met me and um the funny thing is, you know, uh, I got drafted before Alfredson and then Turco went before me and Dallas was supposed to take me. So they had two pretty good careers. So I, yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I look at it, you know, it, it's a thrill of a lifetime, obviously getting drafted, no matter if it's first round or fifth round, it, it's just, you, you look at the opportunity and it's no different than business that, you know, if you're in the right place at the right time, that's your, your shot. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. After so, after the draft, leading into camp that next year, you went to you went to main camp with uh, with the Leafs. Yeah, and my line mates were Ty Domi and Chris King, so that was uh, I knew I didn't have to worry about anything on the ice, but uh, would have been nice to play with Sundin and all that. But yeah, <laughs> it, it was just more of the opportunity that you know you're playing in the the gardens back in the day, and you're looking at the history of what transpired there and. You know, there's not many kids that get an opportunity to do that. And I was lucky enough. But just, you know, you see how they went about their business. And, you know, you, you go out for supper and there's people trying to buy them drinks and stuff. And they have more money than anybody in the, the <laughs> bar, probably. So it's it, it, it it's kind of a, you know, it, it, it's a grateful thing. Do I regret having to retire early? Yeah, it sucks. but stuff happens in life so yeah. yeah yeah so any any big memories from that from that camp i know like for me it was there was a lot of eye openers you know being around just being around nhlers right like for for the first time and and some bona fide ones there in toronto like you did have you did have some big names there you got to got to play with ty which is cool he was my roommate on the road actually when i was with them so uh <laughs> so i knew ty a bit too but uh did you get any exhibition games that year or what was what was your what, how'd you feel about the game i guess you know yeah, I remember, uh, well, one experience I had, because I only played seven exhibition games, but we were flying into New York, and I was sitting beside Glenn Healy, and I said to him, why are we going so early? And he's like, and this is when I got my nickname from uh, Bird Dog, uh, Diesel, and he's like, Diesel, like we're going to New York. Do you not know the traffic? And I'm like, uh, I, no, I'm from Saskatchewan. I've never been to New York, so we... We're there like five hours early and it took us a long time on the bus and everything to get there off the plane. And I'm like, and then I thought I was playing against Gretzky, no word of a lie. And idle, obviously. And uh, um, he had an injury or something. And then he was in the stands. And then I, it was so dark there. I don't know if you played a Madison square before and you couldn't see. And so play the game or whatever. And, you see Janet Jones and Gretzky in the stands. And and then that, that was the game that I played with Kiprios. Uh, that was his last game that he ever played when he got in the fight with uh, Vandebush. Mm. Remember, remember that? I was on the bench. So you're playing with me on that game? I guess. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's the, the game that I played there. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, no, isn't that crazy? I didn't know you were on that. I mean, yeah, I yeah. was on the bench when that fight happened. Um, so that, what, that's what when we were sitting in like chairs, uh, in the dressing room. I'm like, we're in the NHL and we're sitting on a chair. Do you remember those <laughs> dressing rooms, how bad they were? <laughs> I that would have been, I wish that would have been, that would have been, uh, oh, 99 probably. Yeah. 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 Well, it had, well no, it would have been, um, it would have been 98. Okay. Cause I was playing on, uh, uh, Bahanas's line and uh, oh, 
can't remember the Czech's name, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, that was for those of you listening. If you haven't seen that, I mean, not that I, well, maybe you don't want to see it, but it, it was one of, uh, it was ugly. It was yeah. ugly, Rick, really ugly. Kipper took one, then he took two, and uh, just a pool of blood, and he was limp, and it was, it was a tough. I think it might have been that year, but I'm not 100% sure. Oh, no, he was, no, yeah, I think it was probably that year. Anyways, I got to play against Mario and uh, and Gretzky. So in my 41 games, I got to play against those two guys, which is pretty cool, I guess, to be able to say. But uh, I actually picked off a saucer pass from Wayne in the neutral zone. It's one thing I'll never, I'll never forget. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it after I after I did it, but it's pretty cool to pick off a pass from Gretzky. You, you tried to collect the puck after you did that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wanted to just leave, leave the ice with it. <laughs> um so that next year, so you come back, so you have you have your your experience at camp. You come back with the blades, and then you put up a hundred points that next year, which was uh, obviously a big move, step forward, you know. And and just must have been having first line minutes, I assume. Then you were kind of the go to guy. Is that when you started playing with Frank? Uh yes. Well, I kind of played with him a little bit in the rookie year, but not. I was on the third line then, and then moved up to the first line with uh, uh, Willem and uh, Bannum. So. It, once again, it was, you know, traveling lots, uh, the grind coming out uh, west was tough because you're playing like, you know, seven games and nine nights and all that jazz and tough boys and lots of fights. And, you know, to bring up things of uh, the past of people like Belak, like I, he was my roommate on the road with in junior. And, you know, I remember sitting on the bus as a rookie with him and he's six foot six and I'm five foot nothing and i had no room like it was just 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 the memories that you have of people and you know i had nothing to worry about uh, obviously i wasn't a tough uh, fighter um but you had your guys that had your back all the time and unfortunately he's not around anymore but um good good person i remember driving on 8th street uh in our vehicles that uh when we were at camp cuz that was the cool thing to do to you know, see if you could find uh, new friends or whatever. But uh, yeah, no, he uh, he was a character. But yeah, no, it was it was a good year. I remember Lankel. I think he was the leading scorer that year, possibly. But uh, you know, we only played them twice. But yeah, it, yeah. it's uh, it started the journey. It kind of clicked in, and uh, I I didn't do well in the playoffs that year, so we uh, crapped the bed on that one. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Clark. Uh, I mean, he was uh, actually a real nice addition to that line. Probably like, a, you know, you probably welcome that one because he could play. I mean, he he could play, but he was also tough. He didn't take shit from anybody. And, and I'm sure he was one of those guys that was that was helping you and Frank out to be able to do what you guys do. Um, also having somebody like Wade in the back end, you know, Warnsey was there with you guys too. You had a pretty tough team there uh, for sure. Did you... Like, did you, I, I remember, you know, I remember obviously more playing with you in, in the rock than playing against you in, in junior, just because like you said, we only play against each other twice. Right. But you had a little bit of that Marshan quality to you. Was that something that, uh, that you like actively tried to do or, you know what I mean? It was something you were intentional about, or was it just you and your personality and kind of being a little bit of an aggravator out there? Well, I think you hit it on the nail there. It's more, I guess when you were a small player, you kind of had to persevere to do something out of the ordinary. I do regret uh, some of my celebrations with goals and stuff that it got a little carried away, but yeah. I, and I knew the team that I was playing with that I was fine. Like it, if you had to grab the, the mitts off, you did it, but there was always somebody behind you before you even had to do anything. So yeah, you, like I had, a well, we had a tough team and, in uh, St. John's as well. Like it, it was brawl after brawl. I knew what you could do, but uh, yeah, I, I, I do uh, regret uh, probably being a little bit more of a rat than anything like March on. Uh, <laughs> Why do you regret it though? I mean, cause that, I mean, the teams need those guys, you know, I think, right. Like, and that's why I think it's interesting because it, it, like, that's a hard job to do for sure, because you're, you're essentially putting a target on your back in some scenarios. It, it's a, it probably would be a little easier to do it when you know guys have your back, you know, on your team. But, um, 
did you think that that like could you have played a different way like would you rather have not played that way i think that kind of gave you a little bit of the edge though uh that that you that you used when you were on the ice yeah i i, I think it could have probably just been a little bit less but at the same time that kind of you know i i teach my kids like cocky is a bad thing but cocky is a good thing and you kind of have the middle of the pack of how you got to be whether you're a big kid or small kid or you know smart kid like anything in any nature it's just more of um like i remember the time and i don't know if you were on the team with sean thornton we were in the, um playing against the flames and he fought for me and he came in and he was crying i don't know if you were there and he was like i'm the only one that fights i'm the only one that sticks up for people and he kind of you know made me realize what his job was because i remember when he came and it was um one other guy from kitchener came they were in the east coast and they were making thirty-seven thousand five hundred bucks and they came and sean thornton won two stanley cups which is very impressive and he was just a team guy and he kind of knew his role and the funny thing is is you know you played with ty and i played with ty domi and those guys actually had some hands too, and they just didn't get enough. Well, Ty did, but at, at the beginning, Thornton, he he hardly played. It was like, you know, four or five minutes a game, and uh, look at him where he's at now. No, yeah, he, he had an amazing career, and I remember that actually even at the time. I, mean, I would never have guessed that he had, would have the NHL career that he did, like playing yeah. with him. And actually, I've, I've been in contact with him. I'm going to have him on as a guest for sure because he'd be an awesome guy to chat with. Uh, but yeah, great team guy. He was a better hockey player than people give him credit for, for sure. I mean, especially for a tough guy. I remember in practice, some of the one-on-ones he'd pull off or, you know, he'd he'd uh, he'd score some goals in the shootouts or whatever that were, that were pretty impressive. Um, but he was he was somebody that that would stand up for you for sure. He took great pride in that aspect. I think that's where he, you know, that's really what what made him tick. He he loved doing that. I do not remember him uh, going to tears or what because we had such a tough team. Like why? Uh, I'm just what was he what was he upset about it at the time? He felt like no one else was doing it at, at that particular well, point. Well, at that time he was fighting all the time, and it was over and over and over again. And he, I, I I'm. Hopefully I'm not losing my mind, but I, I remember it. It was in St. John playing against the Flames, and I went over to him and I said, you know, thank you for whatever, like, what you've done for me. And uh, uh, to be honest with you, his family was one of the first people that ever came and saw me when I had my surgeries with my eye and all that in uh, Toronto. So, yeah, no, he's, he's on my radar. He's probably one of my favorite people in hockey. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, I have fond memories of of uh, of thirty two for sure. Um, yeah. It was he always wanted me to fight more. It was funny. I remember him and DJ like they were always like, "You got to fight more." You got. I mean, and I, which which maybe I should have. I mean, I guess I don't know. But I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I really wanted to listen to thirty at the time. <laughs> right? I was like, "You can. You need to score more, man. Don't worry about me fighting more." <laughs> oh man. Anyways, well, let's talk about that last year. I mean, that the year where you where you led the league. Um, you had what do you have 60 goals i think you you had and 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 frankie had 79 or something ridiculous um yeah like, he he had he had 83 and i had 63 i think yeah holy smokes yeah you had well yeah 61 in 69 games 159 oh, yeah. points and uh and frankie i'm going to bring it up here 83 goals in 72 games and yeah, 152 yeah. points like holy yeah. smokes that must have been a hell of a ride that year tons of fun hey the funny part is, is uh, Don Clark was our coach. Uh, unfortunately, he's not around anymore either. But um, he would always just say, stay out. Don't come off the ice. And then <laughs> I remember I, I had a back injury when I came out of camp uh, in Toronto. And I'd take the first two games off. And I got eight points my first game when I came back. Eight? And Eight, yeah. And Bantam had uh, a breakaway uh, for six goals in the game, and he missed it. And I was, like, pissed off. I'm like, you idiot. Like, He's like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get more goals. But, uh, yeah, we went on quite a ride. I That was a year that I was kind of 
kind of went in the dumps because of uh, I didn't get even invited to World Juniors, and I was the leading scorer in all Canada at that time. And then uh, I guess the guy in Kelowna, I I won't say his name, but it, he he was the head coach for uh, World Juniors. Everybody could figure it out, but he thought we took uh, too much time on the ice and we were told to stay on the ice. So it, it kind of was a conflict, but uh, yeah. then we went on a run and we just, uh, I made a little bit of money from Toronto for being the leading scorer in Canada. So it was oh. not too bad. Cool. Cool. <laughs> I mean, just as far as you signing your contract, like it, like yeah, it, that, yeah, yeah, that was part of it. It, I had in my agreement that I got so much for, you know, being on the world juniors and being the leading scorer and all that stuff. But, Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. You, you look you look back at it and you go, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda. And I think in our times back then, if you weren't a first or second rounder, you didn't get picked to the World Juniors. Now they actually just pick for the best player, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because Frankie never got invited either, I don't think. Because that was the year. Um, I mean, it's no. I don't think it's a problem saying the name. It was Marcel Como. Like, we had a Western yeah. staff that year, too, and it was a pretty Western-heavy team. And yeah. um and yeah, I don't, I don't remember Frankie being at camp either, which is crazy. That almost sounds like uh, what happened with Ray Ferraro there. The year he scored 108 goals, he he never made the team. Like, yeah. That's insane yeah. to me. Uh, yeah. Mind you, I, I saw an interview with him uh, talking about it, and he's like, well, you know what? As much as I would have loved to have gone and played for Canada, and obviously he was upset at the time, like if he would have left, he would have missed a lot of games and he would never had the record, right? He wouldn't <laughs> have scored 100 goals. So it's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. You know I mean, like uh, how, how it all works. Uh, and and kind of not to be forgotten about, we should mention like Wilmer had forty nine that year. So yeah. you mean, you're, oh, what's that? I got a story for you about him trying to get fifty. So we we were playing in Swift Current, and all Frank and I tried to do was set him up, and uh, he didn't score. And uh, the GM comes in and just went hog wild on Frank and I. Like, why are you doing that? We could have played a different seed in the, the playoffs. So we ended up having to play against Brandon, who was the best team in the league. If we would have won the game, yeah. then we wouldn't have had to play them right away. And we lost out four straight. But yeah, no, we <laughs> all we did the whole game was try to get him a goal and it didn't work out. Just take a short break from the conversation with Mark Dial to say thank you to all the faithful listeners here about my hockey and those of you who have chosen to review and to rate the episode on iTunes. That really helps with the podcast. And uh, those of you that have responded to me personally in a DM or on social media, uh, you know, thanking me for for producing the show, for what it has meant to some of you, and and how it has changed. Uh, and made a big difference for for some of the athletes in your lives. I really do appreciate that. That reminds me uh, of why I started to do what I'm doing. Uh, If you want to follow me on social, um, definitely do that. I'm active on Instagram at Jason Padolin, and uh, also have started a YouTube channel that is growing quite successfully. So if you want to see clips, uh, full interviews uh, with the video, uh, other teachings that I have, uh, YouTube is a good place to do that. And if you are a hockey parent, uh, we've created the best community on Facebook for that. It's a private parent group called Up My Hockey Parent Group. Uh, That's where we interact, support each other, uh, get your questions answered, uh, and help your athlete on this uh, journey of theirs through the hockey universe. So, uh, once again, uh, Instagram is a great spot, at Jason Padolin, YouTube, Up My Hockey, and Facebook at the parent group, um, Jason, or uh, Up My Hockey, uh, private parent group. Uh, You can also check out all the things we have going on at uh, www.upmyhockey.com when it comes to courses, when it comes to working with teams, when it comes to my workshops, and, uh, and my private coaching. So... That's everything up my hockey. Uh, really appreciate appreciate you guys being here today. And now we'll get back to the episode with Mark Dial. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But yeah, wait, what is that? I mean, quick math: hundred and four. That's like almost two hundred goals. Uh, your line eight, scored. Yeah, I think we had over eighty percent of the goals. Just the three of us. That is nuts. But you said like, what, how, how much? How many minutes were you logging a night? Do you think? Oh. Easily over 30, 35. Really, hey? Yeah, we we hardly ever played our fourth line ever. So yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. And then, yeah, isn't that wild? Even like from that scenario and that, that was my last year too, I guess. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like Babcock always played everybody, right? Like it, it, I, I had one game and that's a funny, I don't think I've ever told it on this podcast. So I had a game, my last game of the regular season, it wasn't for uh it wasn't for 50, but it was to break the uh, all time goals record for Spokane. If I would have get if I would have got three that game, and uh, and Babs knew that, and Babs like for whatever reason, like I think that's just more his coaching style. Like he just never he didn't lean on anybody, right? So we we were the first line. I'd have first power play, but I would rarely ever play over twenty minutes, right? It was more like eighteen, nineteen, kind of more traditional kind of style. But this game, we were playing Prince George, and he like he I probably played close to thirty, right? Like he just would not take me off the ice, and guys were trying to set me up. Same thing as Wilmer, right? And I got one in the first, and uh, and I couldn't get the, the other two. Like they just wouldn't go in. Like the goalie was just un- unbelievable. Like he was stonewalling me. And um, the funny one, you talking about having six points. My my biggest memory of the WHL was that game. We had seventy seven shots or something on net because we were good that year too. Like we were that was the year we played Brandon in the final, the year that you you got swept by them four straight. Yeah. And uh, and I had twenty six shots on goal. Oh, wow. <laughs> And I could only score one. So the boys were, uh, Babs were trying to get me out there and the boys were setting me up and I had over 20 shots. And I mean, that you know how hard that is to do in a game. It doesn't say much for my scoring prowess in, in that particular <laughs> that particular night. But anyways, fun memories to say the least. Um, Did you play with my cousin, Trent Whitfield? Oh yeah. In Spokane? Yeah. yeah. yeah so we have, a, we have a pretty good family background, myself, Trent, and then uh, uh, Scotty Hartnell were all cousins, so. Yeah, there's kind of a family tradition. Hopefully, oh, they cool. get kids coming up now can do something. So. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Does Witter, Witter have kids now? Yeah, he's got two. Yeah, he's down in Providence. Sweet. Is he working with he, the club there? He's the assistant coach there, yeah. He was in uh, with the Hitman for a couple of years in Calgary. Yeah. And then he moved back. I think uh, uh, Mrs. Bear wanted to get back to the U.S., and Scott's got two kids now and he's living, I think I want to say in Philadelphia. So, yeah. That's awesome. I'm going to have to have Witter on as a guest. He'd be great to yeah. chat with. Uh, yeah. He ended up having a great career. You know, he, uh, he played the game the right way. Another guy that kind of like he, that surprised me a little bit. And I'd say it to him, talking to him, you know, like, like, like what the career he carved out was pretty impressive. You know, he was a good junior, but I wasn't sure that he was, he'd be an NHLer, but boy, he did what it took to get there. And, and uh, had a good little ride. It's awesome that he's still still involved in the game too. Yeah, I think he he fell into the right spots where the coaches liked the style of play he played. It's the same as Will. Like Frank and I talk all the time, and they're like, or we're like, how did he play all these games and we didn't play hardly at all? I'm like, he couldn't even skate, and <laughs> <laughs> but he fell into the Sutter mold, right in Calgary, like tough. Penalty kill, score ten goals, done, yeah. and uh, good for him. But uh, yeah, no, it's 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 crazy when you look back, and when you get older, you get a little bit more sentimental on things of going like, how did I not make all this money and these guys did? And you know, <laughs> but it's uh, I always there's one stat I always look at. Uh, if anybody beats me at one fifty nine in the next year or whatever, that's what I kind of just as you know. A fun thing to do is yeah. Well, this Con- this Connor stuff. Bedard might, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully he does, and then I can just not look at it anymore. So. Yeah. Oh, well, that'd be a great guy to have beat it, right? Really, that's what it's yeah. all about. You know, Gretzky always said he'd love to see his stuff get broken or be around to see it. That'd be cool if uh, somebody, a young phenom like Connor, could come in and beat your one fifty nine. That's funny though, too. I mean, he, yeah, you always think I don't know. You know the best player, especially when you're a kid. Like the idea of the best player. You, you, I've said that on this show before too. Like you think that the NHL is the best players in the world, right? Like it's the most talented. At least in my head, that's the way it was. But you know they're constructing teams there, right? They're they're architecting how to win games every night, and you can't have everyone be a goal scorer, you know? So there are places for guys like Clark Wilm and there's places for guys like, you know, Trent Whitfield and, you know, like that, that happens. And, uh, and you're a little naive at the time, I think when we're, when we're growing up and going through it, you know, and then we can look back now and be like, yeah, Clark Wilm got 450 games and, you know, I got 41. (laughs) Like, how does that happen? You know, but he brought something right. That, that I guess we didn't bring and somebody, somebody saw it and, and, uh, and he did it well. 
And it's funny though, the, the 49, you know what the, is a funny story is Damon Lankow. So when we were all first years in uh, Sherwood Park, myself, um, Mike Dubinsky, uh, who you remember that name too. He played in Brandon there. It was, uh, I think, a second or third rounder to uh, to Vancouver. And then Damon, we're on a line. And it sounds like me and Mike, like we would, I mean, we were all buddies, good buddies. But we'd make fun of Damon, essentially. Like we have to bounce it off him in front of the net. You know, like that was like that was our, our, our kind of our running gag that year. So, I mean, I was leading the league in points. I think Deborah was right there. And then Damon was doing well, but he was essentially riding our coattails. And then two, three years later, he's like leading the WHL in points, fourth overall, and like the career that he ended up having. Like <laughs> it's so amazing what happens to the guys, right? But we, at the time, Damon would just run guys over. Like he could just absolutely plow guys. He was built like yeah. a body bodybuilder with time he was like 12 and he would just crush guys and uh and obviously he got his few points here and there but i never if you would have told me that he would have led the whl in points like when we were 14 years old like i would have been there's no way i would have put so much money on that um right. but guys develop right and guys you know and he, he did a great job there and tri Cities did a great job developing too and he got in a good spot like you said he had got the right opportunity got the right minutes and he did made the most of it and had a heck of a career um, I remember too, as well as uh, you know, playing against uh, Martin St. Louis and Marty Murray, and we were all little guys. And I, I looked at Martin St. Louis one game, and I was kicked out of a draw or whatever. And I'm side by side. I'm like, why are we in the AHL? And then obviously he went on to a Hall of Fame career, and you know, it, it, it it's no different than business. It being in the right place at the right time, and if you can perform, then you know, you can succeed. And there's a lot of people that don't understand that. Like I did positive speaking for 13 years to promote, don't give up. You know, if you get hurt or you're, you have an ill, like anything of any nature. And, you know, if you even just allow one kid to listen to you out of a hundred that you'd go to schools and all that jazz, yeah, hey, it, it, it's worth it kind of thing. And I think like the crazy part is, is when I listened to Frank Bantam's interview, that you told me that he did, I had to call him and ask if it was him. Because the picture that was shown was Vandermeer's. I'm like, you're not left-handed, first of all. And I said, you were dumber in a brick wall back in the day. And he spoke amazing. Like, I, I was shocked. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's just how you, you know, you, you catch up on times with your buddies and stuff. But I, I didn't even know it was him because I said that picture is not you. <laughs> they had it posted or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, he's like, yeah, that's Vandermeer. And that was me actually talking. And I'm like, holy cow. Because he was talking about the tree in the tree, the car and all that. It's like, I could tell you stories about me and him, what uh, dumb things that we did drive, even just driving to the rink. You know? <laughs> Are you talking about Terry Ryan's interview with him? Uh, whoever that one that you told me that it was that he did. Um, but yeah, it, it didn't sound like, uh, Frank at all. It didn't but, sound like Frankie. Uh, <laughs> um, do you wish you would have had a chance to play with him in pro? You mean, uh, meaning I'm saying that is because you, you can find chemistry with guys, you know, like it, 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 there'll be a player on the team. If the coach is doing it right, that, you know, you usually find something with somebody on a group of 20 guys. Right. But sometimes it just really, really clicks. And uh, again, I didn't get a chance to see you guys a ton together, but that looks like to me, like it really, really clicked. Do you think that was something, was it something special there or, or, or what do you, what do you think? Well, I think I thought, you know, with trying with my agent that I was going to try to get over to Anaheim when he got there, uh, so his background with Frank was he was going to sign with Chicago Wolves back in the day. And I said, just come back. So he came back as a 20 year old and then we lit it up and then he signed with Anaheim, got more money and all that stuff. But I, yeah, you, you could say you would have thought somebody really would have thought um, our chemistry would have been great to be together. Like Solani and Korea, like it, it just was chemistry that they had. They knew where to be. And, you know, I, I still have some VCR tapes that I want to convert to something that I can watch again to see. Cause it, it, to me back then the WHL was the easiest thing that you did. It was just fun. You were a kid and you know, we were making, I don't know, 52 bucks every two weeks or something. I had my own stick pattern. There was no agent that was paying for that stuff back in those days. And you know, you, you, you uh, now kids, you know, get everything free, but yeah, I, I wish we would have got an opportunity. We, 
we did have good chemistry. You don't get it a lot. And, you know, even with Wilm, even if I just had him, he'd you know, know the style of play that we played all the time. So. Right, right. Yeah, interesting uh, that your agent was trying to do that or that Anaheim wouldn't have tried because uh, yeah. why not? You know what I mean? Like it just seems like a smart business deal. Let's see what's going on there. You know, at Toronto, it seems like Toronto wasn't never really had you in their in their high ratings mm-hmm. as a as a prospect, right? And I mean, you and I kind of fell in the same boat there. I ended up getting moved, but um, it was kind of a weird existence there for a few of us in Toronto. Like, not really sure what was going on or what we needed to do, and uh, why not move you on to Anaheim and see what you had done with with Frankie? But uh, yeah. well, I think too, in, our, in, our, in our time too that there was no salary cap. So we could be sent to the minors all the time for three years and it didn't matter. Nobody could pick you up, you know, anything of that nature. And now, which is great that these young kids, you, you, like I watch, you know, enough hockey and all that stuff, but like these kids are unbelievable. Like I, I think of the stick handling they do. You see the videos they do. I'm like, I, I don't think I could have done that at my age. And Maybe you think the same, but it like they're remarkable and it's great that they actually get the opportunity because yeah, they make less money with their signing bonus and all that stuff. And they're like, if you're a fifth rounder, this is what you get. But in the end, like these kids are actually getting an opportunity to play. And I, I think the league has grown big time. Yeah, well, it's definitely younger. I mean, they have to because of the because of the cap. You know, with you need some guys in your system to play NHL minutes, or else you're not going to be able to do it. You know, you need those entry level deals, guys to play, and uh, so sometimes guys are are in there and put in positions a little sooner than than maybe they would otherwise. I know in our time, right? Like it was it was harder, and then even if you get sent down now, right, with the waivers, they they can they can get picked up instantly. Yep. So there's more movement. Uh, you know, I've said it on the show before. I mean, that one year when they ended up finally trading me Toronto, I mean, I was 22 years old and had 42 goals in the AHL. Yeah. 22. And so, for some reason with Toronto, I was washed up. You know what I mean? It's like it didn't make any sense. They weren't even a playoff team, right? Like to get three games that year doesn't just doesn't even make good business sense, right? Like why not see what a guy can do? Um, but, at that, but at the time that we were there, the Leafs were like the bottom of the totem pole for – in points like that's what i mean right it, it, it makes even less sense like you think there would have been more movement from from our squad right like up just to see what these guys can do um even lonnie bahanas like you know what a year he had that year and then he ends up getting the leafs essentially through the second round on his own you know like and then he's out of the game after that that's such a weird story too with him how uh he, how he never played yeah more. he he was very good to me we were good friends back then and uh, when I had my injury, he was we were living together and all that stuff. But yeah, he, I remember it was like you're getting called up, and then I got hurt, and then Lon, uh, Lonnie moved up to the. I, I think he played with Sundin and uh, Renberg, wasn't that the line that they had? And he was like fifth in points that in the playoffs, and then he ended up in Europe and got hurt, and then he had to retire. So yeah. yeah it, I think we had some special people like Connery, like he never really got a chance. Like he was a pretty good player. Uh, he was really good. Yeah. Yeah. I still I, stay I, in contact with, uh, with red, the red rocket. He was yeah, a good player. Yeah, and Lonnie, yeah. I mean, that was fun. I mean, that was one of the ones, you mean, I massively benefited from playing with him that year. I mean, of course, right. That's just the way it goes. And it was, there was the chemistry again, like he was a good player with almost anybody. And like, and that's yeah. the thing that I think that made him special, right? Like he would, he would put up points no matter who was with him. Um, yeah. I just happened to get along real well with them there on the ice and, and yeah, we just worked well and puck was going in and it was so fun to play with somebody that could distribute the puck like that and shoot the puck himself. Um, God, remember how short point. his stick was back in the yeah. day? Yeah. And you could just was, rip it. Oh yeah. Yeah. You could just rip it. And yeah, I mean, for those, if anyone listening, like look up Lonnie Bahanas, that's probably a name you don't know unless you're like a, a big Leafs fan. And yeah, he had, he had a great playoff and I'm talking like that playoff run he was he was making plays and scoring goals that it wasn't like he was just in the right place at the right time like he was he was the guy you know like he was he was scoring he was making he was making plays and winning games for the leafs and then he couldn't he he didn't uh couldn't get back in the nhl it was such a strange thing to me like it's almost like did something happen off the ice that nobody knew about you know that like blacklisted him or something like i i he was too good of a player not to not to get a chance after that but anyways i mean so it goes um, what was your experience like there in the rock? Like even we had, uh, we had a couple coaches that we played for, um, 
and and I've spoken about the lack of communication back then. And and again, not to beat anybody up, but just the way it was. You know, like there was we were sitting there in St. John's. Like sometimes Bill Waters would come out the odd time to see us, and seemed like that was the only guy that would ever have eyes. Uh, and other than that, it was there wasn't too much being said about you know what we were expected to do or who we were expected to be if we wanted a chance to move up. Did, was that your was that your experience too when we were playing there? Yeah, I think the biggest thing too is, you know, Mark Hunter was only with me for one year and he kind of knew that you needed all different types of players, uh, skill, tough, you know, uh, a defensive player, whatever it was. And then mm -hmm. we got an Al McAdam. I don't like he, I don't think was a fan of mine. I can be honest with that, but um, you know, it, it just kind of came that, Nobody was around. Nobody looked at us because of the travel and all that. And then we have to look at it and not having any uh, uh, negative thoughts of it. But we would go on the road for 21 days and play like 15 games. Like no other teams did it. So we had quite the grind. I remember the, the rink in St. John's. Like how small was that? Like it was like a cardboard box that you're playing in. Yeah. And like you, you couldn't go anywhere. If you went two steps, you were getting hit or somebody was on you or whatever. Like we, that, that era was just a different thing. And, you know, they would come see a little bit on the road, but I, I, I just think the exposure of us as players, it wasn't there. There was no internet. There was no, you know, nothing. So yeah. you basically, if somebody thought you were good, and that's why the only reason why I got drafted was Garth Malarchuk back in the day. He pushed for Toronto to draft me because uh, Cliff Fletcher only drafted big guys. And then I got picked somehow. But, right. yeah, I, I think it was the exposure that we didn't have yeah. in my mind. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the, the road trips. And you don't even really realize it at the time. Or at least I didn't. I mean, it was just you're doing what you do, right? But, uh, but yeah, we would... Like, I remember the end of the trip all the time where we'd play four games in essentially four and a half days. We'd have that Wednesday game, and then we would travel, and they'd have a day off. Then we'd play Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon. And uh, and it would always be different teams, different nights. And so you – and and yeah, and that and that's when teams would see you, right? So teams would be seeing you at the end of a, a you know, a, a two-week trip, and you're having your fourth game in, in four and a half days in an afternoon in Portland playing the Pirates – and uh, and hopefully you have your best stuff because that's when they're getting a chance to look at you, right? And we'd always always get delayed in Halifax every time. <laughs> so then yeah. it would even make the trip longer. Like it was always weather, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's good times that you remember all the stuff from Newfoundland and great people and, you know, very welcoming. But uh, I look at it now and I'm like, I had buddies playing the East Coast and they were playing in Las Vegas and we were playing in. <laughs> the rock like yeah. <laughs> it kind of kind of makes you laugh sometimes so yeah. yeah i love my time in the rock it was fun we had a good group there like you said i i just brought up portland and i thought i just remembered that one trip in particular i mean i don't have a great memory about about a lot of that stuff but i remember jp dumont and with bird dog on his back getting cross-checked his face into the into the ice do you, do you remember that one like there were so many bird dog stories you know bird dog rest in peace of course um, not with us anymore, but uh, that <laughs> poor JP Dumont. I was like, oh my God, do I not want to be him right now? Do you remember that? <laughs> he used to do that to me in practice all the time, too. <laughs> so maybe not to that extent, but uh, he was one where you were like, why are you trying so hard? It's practice. And he's like, I just want to kill you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah, he did. He, he, he did. He did keep you honest, didn't he? I remember those now that you say that he was he, he'd be he'd be in your grill uh, quite often in practice. Uh, <laughs> the good old well, days. Get, yeah, good old days. Exactly. Well, let's get to for those not listening. So we, we're here again with with Mark Dale, um, 159, 159 points with Saskatoon ends up being a point of game guy, essentially in the A and the year I get traded. Um, and we spent some time together too on lines here and there, I mean, as, as would happen. And, and we did have some success together as well. Uh, I remember my rookie year, uh, the year I scored 30 goals was mostly with, uh, with you, um, playing. So I, I, definitely had the benefit of some good centermen, but 
that ni- 1989-1999 year was weird in two cents. Uh, one, because of what happened before your injury uh, with, with Jeff Libby. And I want to talk about that because um, it's something that I remember. I was in that game. Uh, Jeff Libby ended up having to stay the night and his team left. And I remember going to visit him in the hospital. Never knew who he was, but he had nobody there. He was in St. John's, Newfoundland, having eye surgery and ended up, uh, I think we might've had a collection actually amongst the guys and like brought in a ghetto blaster for him or whatever to play some music in his room. But let like, take us back to that. So Jeff Libby, you're, you're on a rush and yeah, well you, you, you give me the play by play of, of what went down there with that. Yeah. I, well, I try not to remember it cause it's not a fun, uh, uh thing to remember i remember going and seeing him in the hospital and giving my condolences because they brought his family in on a private plane to to be with him but um just got tripped up and uh the back of my skate came up like a figure skater doing a pirouette and obviously back then not many people wore visors and i honestly didn't even know i touched anybody but um it ended up uh him losing his full eyesight, um, tragic. It, it still haunts me. Um, just, uh, I, I, I guess when you you think of it, you you've taken somebody's career away, basically. And um, obviously, and it was accidental. I went to the 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 ref. I remember during the play because there was all this, you know, don't want to talk about it, but blood everywhere. And I, I, I said, I. I didn't hit him with my stick. I didn't, I, it must've been my skate. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I, you don't hear about it much, but it kind of was something that I always thought. And then I, I knew that game I was done. Like I just was sick to my stomach. I remember the, uh, him coming through our, our uh, dressing room on the cart and stuff. And yeah, I, I contemplated honestly putting a visor on because of that. But in our era, we were always driven a pansy wears a visor. And, you know, who knows if it would have helped me out as well. But I look back and I go, you know, you went to training camp, there was just a helmet. If you remember Nedved, he'd always ask for a visor. And you, you, you just were scared as a kid going into camp to go, hey, I need this, I need that. You just were excited to be there and you know i i honestly contemplated wearing a visor after i hurt somebody but i didn't do it right yeah i mean i mean i can imagine how hard that is i mean but for everyone listening like i was there and you know I, you you said it was accidental like it was completely accidental and you didn't even you know you your feet went you went forward and your feet went up the, the way it happened right and uh and so it was like almost like a scorpion essentially scenario where you, where your feet came up, you had no idea who was behind you, and it happened to catch it happened happened to catch Jeff, unfortunately, you know, in in the worst spot. So, um, yeah, definitely nothing that you did wrong. It was just a hockey play gone wrong. You know, it was a yeah. hockey play gone wrong. And I know at the end of the day that, um, you know, you got to live with that as it being your skate. And uh, you know, and I can imagine how hard that is. But I just want everyone to understand that it wasn't. You know, that there was there was nothing. There was nothing there that you did. You know, I mean, it was it was just just the way it went. Um, how? I mean, and and the obviously the the like the irony or the coincidence. I don't know what it is. Is but like five months later, you lose your eye, right? Like how crazy is that? I shouldn't say lose it, but you know, had an eye injury. Um, like that's nuts to me. But like you, ha- so this incident happens. It's it's your skate that does it. How were you? And like I look back on that as being. Like, I was empathetic enough, like, again, to go to the hospital and understand that. It wasn't like we were idiot gladiators. But, like, I don't remember ever having a conversation with how that would have impacted you. Like, do you was anyone there f- for you as far as the emotional consequences of, of that happening? Do you remember having any conversation with any of the guys? Uh, well, the only person would have been would have been Nick Adijib, our trainer. He's always been good. I stay in touch with him uh, daily. Um, I think that's something that lacks in our hockey world is um i guess who do you talk to who do you you know discuss with like are you embarrassed to do it um just kind of things like that where it's like you know it's no different than the hockey club we paid 
played for or the agent I had or anything of that nature. You're just, you're kind of just a, a person. You're not, they don't care realistically. You're like, I hate to say it, but you're a piece of meat. And you know, whether you're scoring goals, great. Then all of a sudden you're, you're washed up, you know, you're done. They don't, it, it, it it's, it's kind of sad that, you know, everybody doesn't have somebody to reach out to that, you know, you're going to go through depression. You're going to go through all these things because you don't know where to go. I was only 21 at the time. Like I, what am I going to do? Go to school? I don't have any money. What am like, am I going to work? Like it, and it happens to all hockey players that, and you've seen it too, that a lot of them try to keep playing for years and years and years because they don't know what else to do. That's it. Mm. You know, I talked to Rick Gerard, who could have been the same type of player as us, and he never got a chance. And he said he played in Europe for years because he didn't know how to make money. And now we're both in the oil patch, making way more money than what he did banging up his body forever. So right, right. you, you kind of just don't know the avenue to take. And I'm not here for a pity party at all. But stuff happens in life and you got to move forward. But in the end, it's just like you, you, you just you, you sucked it up and you just moved on. That's all yeah. it was. Well, no, I mean, I think you said you're just a person. I mean, I, I actually, one thing I've spoke about quite a bit is that I, I think the evolution of the game is starting to acknowledge that there is a person behind the player. So I, I've kind of used the analogy is that you were just a player. Like you were, you were a commodity that needed to do something hockey wise. And that was all anybody was worried about. Um, now people are starting to understand, and especially in the high performance world, that there is, there is a person behind this athlete. And if you can get to the person and allow the person to evolve and to feel safe and secure and, you know, uh, worthy and, and all these other things, you're going to get way better results from that, from that player on the ice. Right. Um, and I think that we were bred from an era too, that, you know, any type of touchy feely stuff was just not really welcome, I guess, you know, like it, it wasn't something that, uh, that I think guys were willing to be vulnerable about. I think, I think any type of those feelings were either disregarded or pushed aside. Um, and, and it didn't lead to conversation, which is, which is terrible because we're all going through it. I mean, that's the thing I talked with Jason Krog the other day. I haven't released the episode yet, but, um, I played with him in, uh, in Lowell and in, uh, and in Bridgeport, we're all going through the same thing. Right. But like no one ever had conversations about what it was we were going through and how we might've been able to help. Um, I'm speaking that now in a hockey scenario, right? Like trying to get to the NHL and what it takes and all that stuff. But now we're dealing with more life stuff here where you, you know, you, you, you've been a part of this thing that took someone's eye. I mean, there's emotional consequences to that. And so Nick was the guy for you. Like if there, if there was anyone, it was, it was Nick, the, wh who you were talking to about that stuff. Yeah. Cause he kind of, I, I guess I related well with him. So it was easier to talk to him than you know, going to the head coach or whatever. It's just more of, uh, I don't know, we had, and I'll speak on behalf of probably most people that we had just closure to ourselves. We didn't have the availability to open up. Like I couldn't pick up the phone and call my parents because I couldn't afford, you know, a, a minute, uh, a, a dollar a minute to call. Like it, it just, you were in your own space and that's what you did. And, uh, you know, does it affect me today? Yeah. But, you know, you have to try to get through it, which is not easy, whether it's 20 years ago or a year ago. It, it To me, if you don't have a heart, then you're not, you know, in the right, I guess, spot in your lifetime. But, uh, yeah, it, it we had nothing. We had no access to anything back then. And right. it's unfortunate. And I think now... You know, I, I, looking uh, back at Nash talking like when he was in Phoenix and everybody, all they talk about is all these tough guys dying. Well, it all doesn't stem from, you know, certain things. It's, you know, there's a lot of all players at every level. They all come out in a different fashion. And, yeah. you know, whether it's football or anything, it's it it it. it it needs to be talked about, which is a good thing that people are doing now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, 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 you can see progress that people are, you know, you think you're an athlete, 
guess what? The next day you're not an athlete. Nobody gives a flying F about you. And you're not signing autographs. You're not in the limelight. You're not nothing. And, you know, I've been out when I've seen Johnny Goodrow. And, you know, everybody's all over him. Well, there's going to be a day that Johnny Goodrow is not. They don't even know who he is. So. Yeah, no, it happens. Yeah, I mean, the thing back with Al McAdam, too, and, uh, you know, and this is definitely not, I mean, I think it was part of the era then as well, but, like, in in 2021 right now, and, you know, I coach, I coach young kids, but if I was a coach of an AHL team, like, without question, again, it's easier now, like, I would have a conversation with my centerman, Mark Dial, about, hey, man, how, how are you feeling about this? You know, where's where are you at with this? You know, do you need any help with it? Is it impacting your game? Like, I would think that conversation was happened, but, I mean, it sounds like that didn't. That wasn't even a – like, he never brought you in. You never had that talk. Toronto never made a phone call to you. There was, there was nobody that picked up a call and said, Mark, how are you doing? No, nothing. That, yeah, and crazy, it's, right? un, it's unfortunate. And I, the funny part is, is in – we can end this whenever you want, but it's more of, uh, I think with age, you get wisdom and, you know, I look at you doing this, like, this is incredible. Um, you know, I, like I said, hearing Frank talk, I'm like, there's no way that's him. And I think you kind of get a little more sentimental, but knowledgeable in the same time. And you're like, Holy cow. We had it. Like, I think I had it good for three years. Like, I, I I think it was the, you know, best experience of my life. I, you know, any job that I go to, they see that you played hockey. I think we have a competitive edge getting jobs these days, which is tough. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, COVID is the worst thing to deal with, especially with having kids and all that jazz. But in the end, it's more of, uh, I guess, openness that we didn't have. You either liked some of your teammates or you hated them. Like you did, there was always our groups that we hung out with. You either were with four guys or they were with four guys. The European guys were together. You know, now you see a little bit better with sports of camaraderie kind of thing. But uh, yeah, back in our heyday, it was like you hung out with four or five people and that was it. Not not 20. Yeah, well, exactly. And I, and I think the longer I played, the more I saw that, I mean, the teams that did do well were the teams that hung out together, you know, like the teams that were one big family and not four different families, you know, and, um, and again, with, yeah, with wisdom, then you can start to even try and cultivate that, right, as a, as a player on the team. Like, how do we get everyone together here on the same page? Because it doesn't work when you're disjointed. Um, well, let's talk about you, buddy. So, I mean, we, we, you go from, from that and then I got traded. So I got traded a month before your injury happened. So I wasn't around. I was, I was in LA, but I, um, heard what happened to you. And again, it was a different world, even with the media though. Like it wasn't, I didn't know like the next day that it happened. I remember like it was, it was well after the fact that I even found out that it happened because we're all doing our own thing and, uh, and social media was, wasn't around, but what walk us through and walk me through, uh, what happened with, with, with your injury there. And I think it was a playoff game, correct? Yeah, we were playing against the Canadians and then, uh, just jumped off the bench and took a pass. And unfortunately a guy pitchforked me in the eye when I was going at him. Um, uh, he was a, a Czech guy and, uh, yeah, I got hit and fell and went straight to my, uh, my eye. And it was probably like a baseball already. And I knew I was done. So, yeah. So it took three people to pry my eye open, um, for them to see it even. And obviously I couldn't see anything. So you said pitchfork when I read about it, um, leading up there that the, what the way it's written is it was, it was a follow through on a shot, but that doesn't sound like that's what it was at all. No, I was going to him on a one-on-one and he, you know how the can opener used to be with Mc, McCabe back in the day. Yeah. He, he just, I, I don't know if it was intentional or not. I think it was more, kind of a jab to my chest that he wanted to do, but it was uh higher. Straight up in your eye. Um not did it ever did you ever have any closure with him? Did he ever come say hi or say sorry? Uh, Terry or? Ryan. Yeah, Terry Ryan uh brought him up to see me. Um their head coach was Terry and he tried to tell everybody not to come come see me. So I respected Terry Ryan. Obviously we you know, Western Hockey League player and Newfie and all that jazz. So 
yeah, he he came up, but you know, he obviously doesn't speak hardly any English, so it it would. Mm-hmm. It was honorable. I was more happy that Terry just said, screw it to their coach and just say, hey, I'm coming to see you. Say right. Something. Take another short break from the episode here to give a shout out to Rough Dog 113 It is one of the latest reviews coming in from uh, the faithful audience here of Up My Hockey. Uh, Rough Dog 113 gives it five stars. He says, fantastic, I shouldn't say he, I don't know, he or she says, fantastic podcast. I don't even think you need to be a hockey fan to enjoy this podcast. I certainly am, and I am loving hearing the stories that the players tell. It's very entertaining, but also educational and inspiring. I highly recommend the show. Check out the episode with Dave Scatcherd. Uh, I agree, Rough Dog. Check out the episode with Dave Scatcherd. There is uh, some really wild stories there. David is a very uh, animated and uh, excited storyteller. Uh, I really appreciate his energy. Uh, and he has some really crazy turning points in his career uh, that he made needed to make some big decisions. And I actually used his stories um to teach some of my athletes uh you know about character and about decision making and about standards and what it is you stand for because there are going to be seminal moments in everyone's career where you're gonna have to make a decision and uh hearing hearing from guys like dave scatchard is one of those um benefits of hearing stories from those who have come before us and uh, and we can apply it to ourselves. So Rough Dog One One Three, thanks so much. Uh, I keep forgetting. I, I said I was going to uh, read one of these uh, every every episode, and and I just forget. But today I remembered. So thanks so much, Rough Dog. Keep those reviews coming in. It really helps promote the show. Uh, if you've listened to one, two, three, any amount of shows, and you haven't done it, and you listen on an iTunes um, platform, please take the two seconds uh, to give the review. Uh, or at least to rate. It really doesn't take too much time, and it is a big, big thank you uh, from me if you do. Uh, thanks so much, and now let's get back to the episode with Mark Dial. Yeah, well, yeah, like, again, nice gesture. What was what was Tarion's? Did, did you hear what what was his motive to not have anybody go there? You have to be tough. This is the playoffs. Don't don't go there or what? Yeah, I yeah. I heard, and I don't like to talk negative about somebody, but I. I was told that I was that I deserved everything I got. So that was oh yeah. wow, yeah. yeah, wow. From what I heard about him, um, I I can believe it. I mean, again, I don't I don't know either, but um, yeah. sounds like that wouldn't be, that would be something that could be believed. Uh, what? Well, how about the days after? So you say you knew something was wrong there pretty pretty much instantly. Um, what was your recovery like from that? And you went on to play to play games again. Uh, so how did you get to that point where you wanted to give it a whirl? And what was the vision like in that eye? Well, I don't. It's like point like zero five. Like it's I might as well have a glass eye basically. So it's 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 there. I've had surgeries numerous times, but. Uh, no, I came home, um, the phone rang, my mom answered, and it was uh, uh, Finland calling to see if I wanted to go play in the Spangler Cup. And she's like, no, you're retiring, you're, you're going to get hurt. Or sorry, before that, it was Hamilton, that's who, Ed- Edmonton called, sorry, yeah, getting uh, ahead of myself. But So Edmonton called, and then I went in. One sec, though, so, so was your contract done then at the end of the year? Was your entry-level deal done with Toronto? Well, they gave me the fourth year just because I was on disability. And then Edmonton called and said, would you want to come to camp? So I went to camp the next year. So you missed a season then? So yeah. with the eye. Yeah. So you're, you're yeah. out for an entire season. Were you skating at all or were you just recovering from the eye? No skating at all. And then uh, when Edmonton called, I hadn't even worked out. And I had like a week to get trained up. and um so i did it and then when i went to camp the insurance uh that kicked in they only gave me 20 games that i could have before i had to pick between insurance and playing Mm -hmm. so i went in and um i lied i remembered the eye chart for three lines so then i was considered that i had eyesight still in my right eye 
So then I wasn't covered by the Oilers at all just because of that, I, which I wouldn't recommend to somebody that <laughs> has a brain, but I just wanted to play again. So then played uh, just in the Inishbod games. They gave me a chance to go home to decide if I wanted to go to Hamilton. Then went to Hamilton and I played with uh, Pisani, Chimera, and uh, Horkoff. And uh, the coach is like, don't retire. I'm like, well, I have a choice for insurance or to quit. So then I, my parents kind of, we had a chat and we, I retired. And then I came home and then I went over to, that's when I went over to Finland or Switzerland to play with Finland in the Spangler Cup. So that was your last games as a, as a player? I played in the Spangler Cup. It was my last games. And then I got picked up by Davos, which was uh, Pat Falloon and Lonnie Bahanas were playing over there. So they said, we need a player. So I played like four games, couldn't score. And then I just said, I, I suck and I moved on. <laughs> so what was the... And this is just the hockey player in me asking, like, you know, y- y- your vision was, and I mean, like, not your eyesight vision, but your vision on the ice, your hockey IQ was one of your greatest assets, I, I thought. Um, how was it playing at that level with only being able to see out of one eye? Yeah, I had to switch to to the wing so that I could actually kind of turn and see a little bit better because center, you're always down in the middle and down down low and stuff. But yeah, I, when I was in Hamilton, uh, I forget who it was. He was a tough guy in uh, Hartford at the time. And uh, he blindsided me and I lost five teeth and was KO'd and all that stuff. So that was kind of one of the reasons why I retired. Um, just because I couldn't, you turn and you're not seeing them. Just It's like driving a vehicle. You, you know, at least I have the camera now in my car that I can do the right turn just on my camera to right. help out. But yeah, no, it, I know it. You know what? Honestly, it was probably the best thing I ever did was because I, I felt like I had to prove again that I could play, and uh, it was kind of cool to say that you kind of played in all um, uh, hockey worlds, basically. And Europe was a fun time. It was unique. You're seeing a different uh, uh, country, and uh, you know I, I understand why some of these guys go over there and they stay over there, like. Frank Bantam again, like he played till he was 40, uh, I want to say 42. And he said he did it because he his, his family could see the world. They could go to Italy. They could go to Austria. They could go all over the place. And it was free yeah. for the most part, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I know, no, I, it, yeah, I loved it in Germany. I mean, I could totally yeah. say I was only supposed to go there for a year. I ended up staying for three, you know, like that was, that was, uh, I totally know what you're saying with that. How was it like? Like the games, the game's tough and the game's hard and the game's fast. Um, you had the bravery and the courage to go back out there with one eye. Like, was were you scared, for lack of a better word? Like, like, like that experience of having having one eye not exist. Like, you realize that obviously you're blind, right? On 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 one side, and that you're 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 exposed. Like, that was that. I don't know. Everyone's wired differently. Were you actually like? Were you scared going out in the ice or? Were you like, oh, I, I got this? Yeah, I don't think so. I Like, in our heyday, we just, we loved the game of hockey, and you just wanted to play. And, you know, whether you're making 100 bucks or $2,500 a game or whatever we were making back then, you kind of just did it. That was what was in your blood. And, you know, I think now with speaking of, you know, kids and all that activities, they have so many different sports that they can play that we we only had so many. And if you were gifted, you were gifted. And that's what was in my blood was hockey. And, you know, should I skate more? Am I fat now? Yeah. So, but it it's, it's more of uh, kind of just what's in your genes. And I, I think to me, if I look back at it now, it was like, I wanted to prove to people that I deserved a chance and, you know, could I have played longer in Europe? Yeah. There's no hitting over there. There's no, like the ice is like, you you, you don't even know somebody's out there half the time, but it, 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 if I had to make a change in my life, it would have been, I would have went to college and then go pro because when you said, you were 22 we still didn't have an opportunity 
and but a college kid comes out of school at 22 23 and they're considered young still i know we were cons we were considered old because we had played three years in the uh the ahl that's yeah. how it was yeah you no, have, i know we you know, we just talked Carter about all those like, guys that would come and, yeah. and it would be oh here's a new guy well he's older than me but yet he's the young guy i'm like this doesn't make sense at all yeah yeah, sorry to cut you off there, but that was exactly the conversation that we had with with Jason Krog. Like he came out as the, as the Hobie Baker winner, right? He was never drafted. Hobie Baker winner of U, uh, University of New Hampshire, best best collegiate player in the in the land. He was a year older than me, and was playing. I was playing in uh, in Lowell, as was he, and uh, and I was like the wily, grizzled, washed up veteran leading the team in points. And he had like a half a point a game that first year as a rookie. Uh, yet he was just signed for over a million bucks, right? Like. Like he was, he was the, the next thing. And it's, it was a, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just the way that it is. I guess the perception is, is the big thing. Um, yeah, I don't regret my time in, in Spokane at all, but I have said on here before, it would have been really cool to see what the journey would have been like on the other side of the ropes, right? Like to do the university thing, allow yourself some more time to mature physically uh, mature mentally, emotionally, right? Like less games, a little more time in the gym and then come, come out at maybe 22, 23 and, and see what pros would have, would have been like, it would have been a, I would like to have done that experiment, uh, of course, but, but we used to like, I remember getting like stuff from Harvard and all those places and we just threw them away back then. We didn't even look into it. Now, if you get a letter like that, you're like, holy cow, this is awesome. But yeah. I, yeah. we didn't know stuff like we didn't know agents we didn't know like all that it was like life has changed which is is good um but in the end it's like crazy how different it is that's for sure well it was a longer journey you know what i mean and i know well, you and i were in a little bit different positions in our draft year you know like where i was being told that you know you're going to be an NHLer essentially, right? And like, so the quickest way, I mean, you want to be there. I thought maybe I'd be there at 19, right? So of course I'm going to go to the WHL and you have to make that decision as a 15 or 16 year old, right? Like 15 years old, you have to make that decision. That's what, I, that's really stupid. I still think that needs to be changed. Um, you know, why can't I play WHL hockey at 16 and still go get a college scholarship? I mean, like that would have made it a lot easier, but you have to make that choice. And so when as soon as you make that choice, the other dream's dead. Now you're a WHLer, right? And go on the pro right route. But um, I just want to bring it back just to one second, just with the Toronto, with, with just with the Leafs and like maybe uh, not that I need to shine a light on how disjointed they were, but like your contract, you have a year left. Like, was there any discussion at all? Like, through them like with this like there was a business side to it like with the insurance and you being out but like who was talking to you from them anybody like after my injury or yeah after your injury yeah. right so you have a year left in your deal you said or you or I, I don't know exactly what happened there but like did they was there talks of like whether you wanted to continue did they talk about resigning you you know was there any help at all with like the recovery aspect or any of that stuff uh well it was uh kind of just I knew that I'd go into the fourth year just automatically because of the injury kind of thing but yeah there was some talk but it, like not to any extent it, it, it was more of you know me I guess deciding when the right time was to if I wanted to make a comeback so it, I kind of went silent on them realistically because there was no communication um but it, it uh yeah it, it like I said, it, 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 it lacked communication, which I think is the biggest thing in, in anything, whether it's work or family or, uh, you know, all that jazz and we're all our worst critics that we don't do it enough and all that, but no, it, it, you know what, I could have been a, a wolf and just thrown out the door and said, you know, go get them. You're on your own now kind of thing. So, right. and, you know, I could talk about the agency thing for five minutes if you wanted, but, you know, that's another crooked uh, business that a lot of families don't understand. Like, there's a lot of people that think they need an agent just because their friend has an agent and that they're going to change the world. And um, it's it's a it's a everybody thinks of uh, an agent being like Jerry Maguire being on a plane and, you know, all that stuff. Like I did it for 11 years driving a Toyota Corolla just to try to earn some money because that's all I thought I'd. I knew and you know it's uh 
I'm not saying an agent isn't a good thing, but there's the right time and the right place for that as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it's such a competitive marketplace because it is a marketplace, you know, like these guys need players. Um, I had a really good discussion with uh, Joe Oliver. He's part of KO's, KO uh, Sports. And I mean, I think Joe's amazing. I mean, the, the, the thing is, there's good, like in any profession, there's good ones and there's bad ones, right? Um, I do believe that Joe has, you know, his player's best interest is heart. But at the end of the day, it is a, when they make a commitment to you, like they, they don't get paid until you sign a pro deal. And you know how hard it is to sign a pro deal, right? So you need to have a few horses in the stable to even to make that thing work, right? Um, so I can understand why they need to go out there and reach out to these uh, to these players so young because it's so competitive. But the thing is, if you're a parent or if you're a player, you know, what are they providing? You know, do you need one? Right. Like that's the whole thing is like, if is it providing value to you at 14 uh, to have an agent? And if you can answer the yes to that and you think that there is a tangible benefit um, that's real, then uh, then by all means. Right. Go ahead. But I don't think it's something you need to rush. You know, I mean, that's, no. that's for sure. Yeah. And it, and when I was meeting families and stuff, I'm like, okay, so I am here to tell you that your kid probably won't make it. And they look at you like crazy. And I'm like, it's a 0.025% chance your kid would play any pro hockey. And they don't, you know, they're confused. And I'm like, so have you met any other agents? And they're like, yeah. And I said, agents that give you stuff free now, they will make up if your kid makes it down the road. So instead of charging three to 5%, they're going to charge seven to 10%. So if you're making a million dollars, look at the difference of that. So I could give you sticks. And if I think you're going to make it, then I'm, I'm going to make money, but nobody looks at it like that. And no, no agents will tell you the truth because they, they know what they're up to instead of just doing their, their their contract they're going to be doing your financial so they're going to charge there again so they there's always a, a way around stuff which don't get me wrong the agency thing was a fun thing but there are you know certain groups that do certain different things that others can't or don't do so, yeah. yeah yeah you gotta have your eyes open and that's it's uh yeah, I mean, it's a tough place to navigate, which is I mean, reason of the podcast and why I'm doing this, really. You know, what I'm doing, what I'm doing now, and you've, we've spoken about it at length now, is is that communications thing. And you you mentioned that there was no one for you to talk to. You talked to our equipment manager. That was your guy, right? It wasn't mom or dad. It wasn't your agent at the time. It wasn't the coach. It wasn't somebody on the team. And things have changed a little bit. There's more resources, but I still think there needs to be more support, you know, player support and having somebody outside the ropes you know, in, in my position for what I do now, you know, I mean, I'm just helping these guys have somebody to pick up the phone to in a lot of cases, right? Like there's no, there's no secret medicine. Yeah. I'm helping guys with anxiety or with ways to prepare for games or, or some of these things like skill-based things. But a lot of times they just need someone to talk to, you know, someone to pick up the phone, get an unbiased opinion, get some support, someone that, you know, just has your best interest at heart, period right? Like there's no politi there's no politics. And that can mean the world for some players. And I know it would have meant the world world to me. At the time, I didn't know I needed it, but I think that's one of the benefits of reflection. And like you say, with wisdom and age is like, that's what I needed. You know, I needed someone like me doing what I'm doing now. That's what I needed. Well, my kids always ask, they're like, wow, you have so many friends. I said, it's easier to communicate with your friends than your family. <laughs> you just walk away from your buddy and, you know, you, you know, you're going to see him again. Uh, you know, family takes it a little bit touchy. They, you know, you add in-laws, you add all that stuff, but sometimes all it takes is somebody that you can trust that, you know, is going to go, you know what, I'll give my advice, but at the end of the day, he's not sleeping in the same house as mine. So, you know, have an open ear. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of people that don't understand how important that is. Just it, honestly, whether it's work or hockey or, who even like coaching or anything of that nature, like, Hey, what, what would you have done in this situation in the game? And, you know, you come home, you beat your head on the wall and, you know, we're all hard on ourselves with, uh, if you're a competitor, which most sports people are that it's like, Hey, you want the best for everything, but sometimes you come up short. And I, I'm, I'm a preacher of, if you don't give it a shot, you don't know what you got. And there's the, the all end, you can be the best player. You can have the most points. You can have all that stuff. 
all that matters is, you know, give it your all. And, you know, do I ever think negative about hockey? Yeah, obviously, because I didn't get an opportunity um, to what I thought I should have got. Um, but in the end, can I say that I hang my you know, draft jersey on the wall and people look at it and they go, wow. I'm like, yeah, that was like umpteen hundred years ago. <laughs> It's more just the, uh, I, I, I think it's great what you're doing with the podcast and, and, you know, to keep in touch with the guys. I miss the guys that I used to, you know, be around all the time. And, you know, half the time, the only time you hear of anybody, if they die or, you know, get divorced or that nature. And, you know, we have the, the source to do it. I think it's easy for me and you to connect obviously now and, you know, moving forward. But it's, it's nice to hear people's, you know, thoughts on what we, we did. Cause yeah. when I talk to my kids about what I used to do, they have no clue what we used to do is like driving on the bus for 14 hours to play a, a, a hockey game. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Maybe yeah, they would, but <laughs> it, it, it's just a, we live in a different era, right? So, yeah. Um, no, I think it's, yeah. I mean, I really, I, I really uh, appreciate you coming on today and, and sharing your stories. I know some of that stuff wasn't easy to talk about, but, um, Again, I think there is there's a lesson from experience and there's a lesson from what we've gone through, you know, uh, individually. And whoever's listening to this right now, you know, the uh, the idea of perseverance and the idea of, of coming back and the idea of that communication matters. Like those are all takeaways from this that um, can benefit somebody. Like you said, you know, when you're doing your speaking, if you reach one kid out of a out of 100 or 200 at a school, you've done your job, you know, and that's sort of the way I look at what I do now is obviously the people that I work with one-on-one -on -one or even as teams, you have more direct contact and you're going to affect more. But the idea of the podcast is, you know what, some, your story and hearing to this might just be that, that, that ray of light, right? That inspiration or that motivation or some clue that, Oh, you know what? I got to reach out to this person or like whatever the case may be. I'm, I'm hoping this, this podcast is making the world a better place little by little, you know, uh, story by story. And I think that you're, uh, well, I know that your story is, is definitely, it, it'll touch somebody. So thanks so much for sharing it today, Dees. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I I truly believe that it's just one by one that you can try to help out, and um, you know, there's lots of people that have way more uh, worse injuries than I did, and uh, they still succeed and move forward too. So it's uh, it's a growing process. Don't get me wrong. I'm not uh, going to beat around the bush about that. But in the end, it's uh, good to catch up, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, no, thanks so much, man. Thanks for being here today. And uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. Cheers, buddy. Okay. See you, bud. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end for another episode of Up My Hockey. Um, Mark Dial and his story, really wild stuff. Um, I've had a few conversations since we recorded this interview. And uh, the Michelle Terrian stuff actually runs really deep uh you know mark mentioned in this interview that uh michelle terrian told his team not to attend um and visit mark at the hospital uh i guess there's many many people there uh heard i guess it was out in public that that uh that he he thought mark dial got everything that he deserved i guess i mean i wasn't there obviously but um from those who were uh, it seems like that was something that was definitely said uh there was some altercation with Lonnie Bahanas who was sticking up for his teammate uh the, I guess it goes on and on um you know Terry Ryan uh sounds like he he and and Garen who was the guy whose stick actually hit Mark Dale um got in quite a bit of trouble from Terry and for going to the hospital he, they were called traitors I guess in the dressing room um, which he was going to get sat out of the lineup. There is a lot of stuff um, that to unpack with with that whole stick incident, and uh, it's unfortunate that you know around something as serious as you know a human being losing their eye that there is all this distraction and, and ridiculousness around whether whether a, a, a player can go even visit him in the hospital. So, anyways, I guess that's. Uh, that's life in 1996 or whatever it was uh, when we were down there in the 90s. Uh, things things aren't uh, uh, now. The, things don't happen now as they did then, uh, thankfully, because uh, some of those antics uh, are definitely not needed. And uh, it's almost so like I've uncovered so much stuff since this uh, 
this interview and, and since the conversation with Mark, I really want to talk to Lonnie, Bah- Lonnie Bahana. So if anybody out there knows my ex centerman Lonnie Bahanas and knows how where to track him down, please uh, DM me. Let me know where I can find him. Uh, I may have Terry Ryan on again uh, to talk about all the stuff that uh, that he's he's told me offline here that happened during that playoff series and uh, and what happened after you know the incident with Mark. And uh, anyways, because I think there's some strange stuff there with the, with the Lonnie Bahanas. He was one of the best players I ever played with in the AHL. One of the best hockey players I ever played with. Period. And uh, and that season, he had nine points in nine games for the Maple Leafs after after uh, the, his exit with St. John's. He had uh, I think he had six points in six games with the Leafs that year as well. And um, never played never played a game in the NHL again. It's uh, it's a bit it's a bit of a strange one. Anyways, I'd love to get to the bottom of it. So, like I said, if anybody out there knows um, Lonnie, uh, by all means, get in touch with me. And uh, Mark, if you're still listening, thanks so much uh, for taking the time to share your story. Uh, again, boy, I wish we were we were there for you better than we were. That is, uh, yeah, that's something that uh, that I've thought a lot about since since our discussion, and it's, uh, you know, it's. It's something that I'm not proud of, you know, to uh, to understand the impact of that in that scenario for you. Um, like I said, even though it wasn't your fault that you would maybe internalize that, and, and even the fact that it wasn't your fault, but it was your skate that took another player's eye, I'm, I'm sure that had a, had a big effect on you, and I, and I apologize that uh, trainer Nick seemed like he was the only one there that would recognize that. So a um, lot of time has passed, a lot of water under the bridge, um, but... Yeah, I appreciate you sharing your story, and uh, until next time, everybody, play hard, keep your head up.